Old Testament, was in the whale for three days, and then he was out again. And historically, the, um, other seamen have had that kind of experience. So it's not a, a one-off part of mythology that's in the, in the scriptures. Um, so Jesus is saying to them, in effect, in typical Eastern poetry, I'll be in the grave for three days, then I'll rise up, and that will be a sign to you. Um, we need to look at the context. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees who come to test him. They come, their context is that they want to publicly embarrass him. They want to challenge what he says in such a way that he will lose credibility amongst those that he's talking to. So Jesus is talking to a hostile audience. These comments are not made to people in pain. They're not made to people who are just getting along with life but find things difficult. They're not directed to genuine people or sincere people. There's no New Testament passage that warns us against seeking miracles. Acts 4.30 says, Lord Jesus, stretch out your hand to heal. Galatians 3.5 says, do miracles happen amongst you because you follow the teaching of the Pharisees or because you believe, because you trust in God? Acts 3, 6, remember that story, the cripple at the gate of the temple? They, uh, Peter and John say to him, look, silver and gold we don't have, but what we do have we'll give to you. Stand up and walk. And he does. And you remember Acts 10, 38, God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. So we need to understand that the... Uh, if you read the Gospels carefully, I encourage you to study them. Jesus actually said the healing is the bread for my children, the children of God. It's, a, uh, it's something that God wants to give us. Um, now, today I want to continue on with the Beatitudes. I had an introduction last time, and uh, so this time we'll take the first one. Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, and he climbed up on a hillside. And those who were apprenticed to him, his disciples, those who were committed to him, they climbed up with him. And arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and he taught. And this is what he said. He said, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With, with less of you, there's more of God and his rule. Now that's out of Peterson, of course, the message. But you can read Matthew 5, 3 in a... In, in a version that's less contemporary. Just look, of course, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, next time I preach, I'll probably do the, the next one. Blessed are those who mourn, um, to admit that we are hurting. Blessed are the meek, I will take advice. Blessed are those who hunger after righteousness. I really want to be right with God. Blessed are the merciful. How do I treat other people? Blessed are the pure in heart. I'm admitting I want to see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. I will make bridges between people. And blessed are those who are persecuted. I will be happy in the service of the king, no matter what it might bring. So the Sermon on the Mount is really like a symphony. It it builds together, and when you take all the aspects of it, there's a real healthy wholeness in the whole of the, the passage. And there's a logical sequence. Um, if you read very much of uh, philosophy, particularly the words of the East or of the modern atheists or of the existentialists, you, you find a philosophy of despair and no future. Uh, in the ninth century in Islam, one of the Sufi mystics said, your existence is a sin with which no other sin can be compared. A uh, thousand years before, Jesus, a Greek writer, said, it's better never to have been born. And Robbie Louis Stevenson, who wrote Trevor Island, Treasure Island, he said, what a monstrous thing it is to be a man. What a disease of the dust. So if you and I are indeed blessed if we receive the revelation of God through Jesus because above all, and there's a great uh, contrast to a lot of teaching, this is something that gives us hope. 
Oh, the blessedness of the person that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Oh, the blessedness of the person who does not stand with those who are sinners. Oh, the blessedness of the person who does not sit with those who mock. Anyone have an idea where that comes from? Psalm 1. So when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, he's really a declaration that has a long history. Of course, it comes out of Judaism where the declaration is a remarkable blessedness if this is what we follow. It's a, it's a, it's a grand statement. It's a declaration. It's a, something that's exalted and dramatic. Jesus is saying, if you're really poor in spirit, you can be blessed because yours is the kingdom of heaven. Of course, the trick is with you and I, do we receive it? <laughs> the, uh, the word there is that, that the context of it is that we would be like the island of Cyprus. We would be Macarios. We would be complete in God. The island receives beautiful sunshine, rain, it's good soil, you can grow, you can grow anything. So Jesus is saying, if you experience a real poverty of spirit, then you experience a joy and uh, something deep within that's a great reassurance of the presence of God deep within. It's more than happy because the English word happy betrays itself in that its root word is chance. But what Jesus introduces us to is something beyond chance. Your joy, said Jesus, is from God. And no one can take it from you and no one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. A change in fortune, a collapse in health, some kind of alteration in life, the failure of a plan. But there is within us, by the gift of the Spirit of Jesus, a steadfastness and a reassurance that we are not alone. A Christian, a follower of Jesus, enjoys something enviable, something untouchable something pristine within that comes from the outside. It's an objective truth that brings within it a presence and a motivation and a wisdom and a way of looking at things that are not to be found in any other place. In the Greek language in which the New Testament was written, there's two words for poor. The first one is penos, which means, uh, describes a person, say, who's a day labourer. He's not sure what will happen tomorrow, but today he's got a job. Today he has some wages. Today he will eat. Might only be one meal today, but he will survive. He will eat. Penos. The other word for poor is patokos. That means somebody who's desperately poor. They don't have anything. <laughs> They're not sure where the next meal is coming from. They're not sure if they'll survive to the end of the day. It's interesting that Matthew chooses that word when he says, oh, blessed are the poor in spirit. It's patokos poor, desperately poor, hopelessly poor. You have no guaranteed future at all. Jesus says, if you're, you are really blessed, when that's your understanding of yourself, then yours is the kingdom of heaven. I went to a short-term mission trip over in northern India and I met quite a number of Hindu men who had become Christians they found that they, they sold all they had um, to get to a, a, what they call was a Bible college, which was usually one room or it was a canvas awning stretched to protect from the sun and would gather under that. Their story inevitably was that someone in their family was sick. Their wife was dying or they were dying. Something seriously was wrong. But because they were low caste, the Hindu priests wouldn't pray for them. And even if they paid the Hindu priest, which didn't have the money anyway, he would still refuse because he would say, if you're lower caste, that's your karma. And I wouldn't want to disrupt the process of faith to disturb your karma. So these people are locked into a situation of hopelessness and utter despair. Someone would invariably say to them, there's people down the end of the street that will pray for you or around the corner. These people, of course, are Christians. And they would pray in the name of the authority of the risen Jesus and people would be healed. They'd be well. And they said, well, we really need to become 
Christians and have some integrity and follow through on what's been revealed to us. And so they would come and, uh, and, and a few of us were there to try and share some knowledge with them. Um, but it, it captures that idea of patokos. It's interesting as you read the Old Testament, you see with King David, he says, God, create in me a clean heart, O God. Don't cast me away from your presence. Renew a right spirit within me. There's somebody who understands his heart. What's the Apostle Paul say in Romans 7? He says, I do love God, but I have another law at work within me. Uh, I am a, a wretched man indeed because I try to do what's right. I have an idea what's right. I have a conscience, but there's another law at work within me. O oh, wretched man that I am, he says. Who can deliver me from myself? And what does he say then? He says, the one anointed of God, the Holy Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is risen from the dead, he is the one who is my saviour who will deliver me. What's the prodigal son say in Luke 15? He comes back to dad and he says, I'm no longer worthy to be your son. He's got an understanding of who he is. It's at that point God can work in us and begin to fill because that person has made room for God. Once we start being honest in all of our life, especially in our prayers, something amazing can break through. We can swallow our pride and ask for help. It even is effective amongst human beings to say, I need help. It's a beautiful thing to say because people, particularly uh, Christian folks, will say, what can we do to help? And we've seen that in what Tim initiated over these past few years here with us putting uh, non-perishable food in boxes and giving it away to people at Christmas time. So in every era of our lives, the principle is the same. If you've never read anything of E. Stanley Jones, who's been a missionary to India, I encourage you to read of him, E. Stanley Jones. He was a man who met with Gandhi from time to time, a very educated man, very well spoken, and he used to hold conferences across India and be invariably his pattern was at the beginning of every conference conference he would hand out pencil and a piece of paper piece of paper and he'd say to the people put down what is your need write down what is your need today and invariably somebody would stand up in that process and say excuse me doctor i don't have any need i'm not aware of any need to which he would always answer write that down you don't know what your need is you need a revelation of yourself to yourself. And uh, he's, uh, he, he repays, repays the effort to read whatever he has written. Well, uh, some time ago, some of you have heard this story. I just want to recount it again briefly. But um, there was a, a man from New Zealand knocked on our door uh, and he... Uh, ostensibly wanted to know the times of, and dates of some conference in Melbourne. But as it turned out, it was really that God sent him to, to us. And he uh, we came in and sat down and we had a couple and he prayed for Maggie and I. And uh, he, he, he uh, said to us very clearly, he said, you two are not in a good place. And it was true, basically my fault because I was too busy in inner suburban ministries, always a bottomless pit of need and uh, people in trouble. And uh, um, we were involved in mission and uh, with uh, a couple of halfway houses going with alcoholism and polydrug users and all of the confusion that there is in... Uh, you know, a suburb of, of folks in need. I had a couple of legalistic lazy elders who were always like dogs on my heels trying to uh, accuse me of something or not cooperate with something. I remember I wanted to get a, a prayer chain going 
and they uh, fought against that as fiercely as they could. Um, we, yeah, we had people living in our home, sometimes for weeks, sometimes for months, sometimes for eight or ten years. We were just too busy. Um, I realised that. I, I had a cough. I couldn't get rid of it. I was coughing all the time. Um, so John, this New Zealander, comes in and he says, you two are not in a good place. And then he says to me, he says, God really wants to be your father. Well, that's kind of, that's what you say every week in church, don't we? We say that. And uh, But little did he know that my father didn't want any children. So when I came along, uh, Dad only spoke to me when he really had to. And uh, there wasn't really uh, any fathering there at all. So what he said was very penetrating and meant an enormous amount to me, though it would be to many people just something, a run-of-the-mill hackneyed Christian saying and so things went on from there where we had a real a deep experience of the Holy Spirit and our direction in ministry was changed and uh, I was greatly strengthened by his words and by that experience and by the conference that, that followed. We get to a point where we're ready to learn and ready to receive at that point something had happened to us. There's a beautiful Eastern saying that says uh, what is it? When the when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Isn't that beautiful? There's something in that. So blessed are the poor. It's really like Jesus is following this Old Testament pattern where he's saying, oh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Right, get that right first, and then theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, we need to... Um, understand that you know with king david and the prodigal son paul the apostle this i believe is god's pattern while, while i can cope and i can do a few things and i can hope a little and plan a little and jockey for position and and organize things that i'm not too embarrassed well god's not really welcome but if i can blatantly go to god and totally honestly say lord this is beyond me at that point he can move in at that extremity. Uh, it's, it's worthwhile noting that in the time of Jesus, the name of God was never written down. The name of God was only spoken uh, once a year on one day of the year when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and talk to God about forgiving the sins of his people. And then the name of God would be spoken. But when the scribes wrote it down in the documents, they only wrote down four letters, four consonants, but never the vowels. They would always um, take their clothes off, they'd have a wash, they'd put new clothes on, and then they would write those four consonants. I, I think we've, we're always on this kind of a learning curve of the greatness of the holiness of God. And the people in those days, at least some of them, had an idea of this otherness of the being of God, the utter contrast between us and God himself, so that when they referred to God, there was this great admiration, this great reverence that I think many of us are, are trying to get to grips with in this world and our culture where we're just so familiar, you know, everything's relative and we need to be so familiar with God and Jesus is my older brother and there needs to be an aspect in our lives where God is God. We are just a wisp of smoke. We're like green grass in summer. We rise up and we're gone. But God lives forever. The death of King Louis the Fourteenth, the priest said, there is none great but God. What a brave man. But what a truth. And there's something about the singular otherness of God that we're always moving towards, or we should be in our understanding and worship of him. The poor in spirit receive from God if we make room from God. The kingdom of heaven only exists where there's room for the kingdom of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And Romans 5.15, how much more did God's gift of righteousness come by the grace of that one man and blessed so many? Romans 5.17, by the trespass of that one man, death came into the world. 
but by the life of one man, the gift of righteousness and holiness came through the man, Christ Jesus. So God wants to give us a gift, but we have to have room for it. If we're full of the distractions in life, there's never room for what God wants to give. And part of our challenge in this day and age for every one of us is to simplify our lives and choose which things we will not be good at, which things we will not know about, which things we will be ignorant of because I'm making room for the kingdom of God. I'm making room for the Bible. I'm making room for the presence of God in the life. In the New Testament, Peter said, Depart from me, O Lord, I am a sinful man. He had a revelation of himself. And uh, what, did the, what did Jesus out of his humanity setting the pattern for us? He said, I do nothing but what I see the Father doing. I say nothing but what I hear the Father say. The reliance and the dependence on God set up for us as a pattern, a tokos, having no resources, poverty, of spirit, poverty, understanding in myself, I need to be receptive for God. Isaiah 57, verse 15, God says, I am the high and lofty one, and I live with the person of a humble heart. Gideon said, Lord, why would you work with me? He said, I'm the least of my clan, and my clan is the least of my tribe. See, it's a similar principle. Moses said, why would you choose me to lead the people? I can't talk. I stutter when I try and talk. Why choose me? He had an understanding of himself. What about King David? Why choose me? Look at my brothers. They're so big. They look so great. They're so important. They're so powerful. You know, the world sees them when they walk by. What about Isaiah? Lord, why choose me? Woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in a people of unclean lips. There's someone who's got an understanding. A person who is poor in spirit sees themselves truly. Well, blessed are the poor in spirit means that I can't live alone. I need, if I've got some integrity and some honesty, I need to go to God and say, Lord, it's too much for me. I don't have the courage, I don't have the integrity, I don't have the righteousness, I don't have the wisdom, I don't have the pedigree, I don't have the wherewithal to be all you want me to be. At that point, God can come in because we make room for him. Humble ourselves to receive God and empty ourselves to make room for God. For the righteousness that is a gift, for the joy that only he can give, for the peace that passes understanding, for a life that knows no ending and for a faith that moves mountains. Jesus would say to you and I this morning, do we love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength and with all of our mind? When we get towards that, we make room for the kingdom of heaven. Hey, son. Thanks, Ross. That was a great word. Some challenges in there and um, some things to think about.